Thank you so much for coming tonight. So I want to start off uh, with Neil Rhodes, who's going to be speaking with us about his current research paper. Um, many of you probably remember Neil from last spring when his research along with his co-author was um, Malia Miller-Pierce, and they wrote a peer-reviewed paper that was produced in a scientific, accepted into a scientific journal regarding water quality in South Maui. What they did was take water quality data that the DOH had been collecting for many years, and they interpreted it so that all of us could see what it actually meant. And it meant that, to our dismay, that the water quality in South Maui is worse than the water quality in West Maui, where everyone's been so concerned about water quality for so long. So we decided to hold a workshop and see what we could do about that. Uh, the council asked Dr. Eric Brown, a marine biologist, to come over and tell us what impact that would have on the reefs. And hydrologist uh, Daniel Amoto, Dr. Daniel Amoto from UH, came over and talked to us about how that water makes its way, the wastewater from septic systems and uh, cesspools and injection wells, makes its way into the ocean. Steve Barbacoli talked to us, and Steve's with us this evening, which you get Steve. Steve is a former superintendent for the Kihei Wastewater Treatment Plant, and he, he's been studying this for many, many years. He's an expert in the field, and so he's also started with the workshop about the impacts of wastewater and what we can do about it. So we then asked him to write a report to give us some guidance on what we could all do, give, come up with a plan for what we can do to improve water quality uh, from Malaya to McKenna, just as a pilot project. So, Steve, thank you for being here again tonight. Appreciate that. So, that wasn't enough for um, Neil and Malia. They decided that they were going to write another paper and analyze the microbial content of the DOH data. So, I'm just going to turn this over to Neil. And if you can't see very well, just move your chair. You know, this is very formal. You want to go get something to eat, do that. Just get yourself to where you can see well and, and you're comfortable. Hello, everybody. <laughs> Luckily, Robin covered my first couple of slides. There's a couple things I want to say up front. <clears throat> can everybody hear me all right? Um, like I said, I'm, I'm not a biologist. If I get things wrong, I'm not afraid to just, you know, have you point it out to me. I'm going to be going really fast. Some of the slides you won't be able to read very well, and I know that just up there because this is kind of a quick and dirty in the process of doing it. When we get completed, then we're going to make more presentation quality stuff, but I've been spending the bulk of my time trying to get the results that we'll get to here at the end of the presentation. So if you have quick questions, go ahead and, and raise your hand and ask me if it's a more lengthy question. Let's hold off till the end. Okay? So uh, this is just the cover of our previous paper. And these are some of the main points that were in there. Um, these are the uh, Kalama Beach uh, Cove Park. And right up there is the base of Lupoa Street. Um, over here is the wastewater treatment plant and Kaikili Beach, Honolulu up at the top. We'll be talking about all these sites, so I wanted you to have a refresher. This is... Let me slide that over a little bit. Can't do that? It's misaligned. There's, there's screen. Uh-oh. Um, <laughs> this is from the previous paper. This is just a quick summary. And these are the four sites that I was talking about. Kihei South, uh, Coloma Beach, Cove Park, uh, uh, Cam 1, and then up here, uh, Honokulai, Kahakili, and Black Rock. What do and the yellow lines mean? So these, the yellow lines just refer to wet season and dry season. So this is just uh, total phosphorus, total nitrogen. Up there is turbidity, and this is chlorophyll. So you're seeing that, that in South Maui, things are generally considerably worse. 
we'll be talking a little bit later. I use nitrogen as an example of, as I'm moving through, but you'll see that we have lots of nitrogen down here. So looking at the microbial analysis, there's several things I'm going to be covering. Uh, let me just zip through because I'm going to run out of time. I'm but we're afraid. not in a hurry. We're okay. Yeah. All right. Well, and I apologize. You can't read this either. I was hoping that it would be more legible. But these are the numbers that refer to the levels of attainment or non-attainment for state standards. So the numbers that are in red that you can't read, that indicates that the water is impaired and does not attain the state water quality standards. The green numbers that we'll be seeing throughout the rest of the presentation indicate that we've attained the standards as of 2004, the 2004 standards. And in yellow and orange in between are just gradations of, of barely making attainment. It says 2014 up there, so what are those standards? So this, what I did to start out with, I was wondering what are the standards, where did they come from, how did we get where we are? So I went to the law library and I wanted to look up the Hawaii administrative rules, that's where the standards are given, but they didn't have them there. Long story short, I had to go and basically hire somebody over at the Supreme Court, the State Supreme Court Law Library to do legal research to find these old standards and produce a document to give to me. So I got that document with all these photocopies of old things and I went through and I analyzed. So this yellow line is the 1992 standard and up at the top is the 2014 standard. Just the quick summary is the geometric mean limit here is 7, up there it's 35. Over here, this is the single sample limit. It used to be 100. Any single sample over 100 colony forming units meant that you failed to attain the water quality standards. Up here in 2014, you can have as much as 10% of your samples be above 130. So, what we're seeing is a relaxation in the standards so that they can try to keep saying that the water is still meeting, still has quality. Uh, this was a little bit of the behind the scenes, what I'm going through to try to generate the results. This is an example page of the raw data. There's over 20,000 rows, 44 columns. This is what I'm sifting through to start with. It covers, the, the full data covers 43 years. They only have the uh, microbial sampling for the last 28 or so. So I went through, matched up water sample numbers, or uh, sample IDs, pulled everything together, and I get in, end up with about 16,000 rows. And then I went through, and the standard applies primarily to sets of water quality samples that are taken in a 30-day window. So you have to move through time and look for, you know, in every 30-day window, how many samples do you have? You have to compute the statistics, the geometric mean, look at, if, is there 10% of them that are above that statistical threshold value? Those kinds of things. So there's over 12,000 of those 30-day sets of samples that I was able to analyze, pull out of there. And from that, I aggregate all the scores into the 78 sites that were sampled, uh, frequently enough for us to have results. Um, we'll be talking about this a lot more later. Did you only look for the sites on the south side, or did you just aggregate everything? I looked at every site around the island of Maui. Wow. Any, anything so you could do more reports. Well, <laughs> not really. What, I, what I'm saying, there's 78 sites that I'm going to be showing eventually uh, some nice results. 
there are three or four more sites that were sampled just sporadically or intermittently, but not enough to generate anything meaningful. Who took the sample? How were the samples acquired? <coughs> the uh, Department of Health has a person, uh, I, guess, I think his name was Roland. So it was the one retired. guy that was hired yeah. Yeah. that's no longer there, but it, was, but it was the person that was employee of the County yeah. Okay. Okay. And I and I don't know how long it was him or who was okay. doing it but beforehand. It was that position. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so something that's new coming out in the uh, 2016 integrated report to Congress that the Department of Health is preparing as we speak, they're going to take those 79 sites and they're going to aggregate them into what they're calling watershed decision units and. As far as we can tell, there's only 33 of those around the island. So some of them have only one site. Some of them have as many as eight sites aggregated into one watershed. Uh, the reason I'm being wishy-washy about that is they, they, the state, have not decided what the watersheds are yet. So this is just a preliminary, preliminary mapping. So now, this is some results, finally. This is a... Scatter plot. This is the enterococcus numbers along the bottom. You want to explain what that is to everybody? Or? I, I, I'll, I'll get there. <laughs> On the other side is clostridium. And she's saying explain that. I do have a slide later. It's like I have to start somewhere and follow, uh, follow through and go back and forth. So the blue points are the individual samples, the individual water quality samples that have been analyzed. So the enterococcus is this value, and then the clostridium is you know, the y value. So this allows you to see whether it's skewed this way, if it's enterococcus, it's the primary path, or, well, microbe, or whether it's clostridium going up. And you'll see some of each kind later. The colored circles are these geometric mean calculations that are, that are made on those 30-day sets of um, samples. And they're considered, that's what the state really wants to look at in terms of assessing water quality. So this is the same kind of plot, only four that I've taken from West Maui and four that I've taken from South Maui. So here you can see it's a little bit more vertical. This is pretty much a diagonal. Some of these other ones are more skewed to the right. What's the significance of one for clastridium? Why did so many fall right on that line? Oh, that's a really good question. Uh, can, can you read the, the location names in the back? Yes, no? Yes, what's the title of each one? Yeah. Um, so the question was, why are there so many samples that are right along the one? And you'll also see there's a lot of them that are along the 10 in a sort of a vertical banner. Um, I'll talk about that a little later, but what happened is the state eventually stopped measuring in the range for endocaucus, stopped measuring below 10 used to be they would measure down as low as 0.2 or 0.3. Nowadays, it's, they say it's less than 10. And the reason they had to do that is because the way they do the assay, they can either have good resolution down below 10 or they can have good resolution up above 1,000. So, so many samples are up in that range now that they've shifted, which makes it difficult for us to really compare yeah. New, yeah, new samples versus old samples. Uh, here I've added in some for the uh, North Shore. And I'm sorry, I uh, forgot to pop them up on top. But this is uh, Kanaha, Sprecklesville. Uh, which one is that? And this is <coughs> Hokipa. Yeah, Hokipa. 
Yeah, so sorry. Um, the point I want to make here is, I mean, take a look at that. Basically, the distribution pattern is about the same. Some sites, this site, there's only 68 samples, 68 pairs. Up here, there's 1,042. If you were to choose, you know, a, a random sample of 100 sites out of here and put them down here, it would look about the same, and that's what we're seeing. So what I noticed from this is that the problem that we're having is West Shore, South Shore, North Shore. It's all around Maui. Pretty much anywhere there's population. <coughs> so what can we say about human health impacts? Uh, sadly, not very much right now. The Enterococcus that they're measuring, there's 17 species, about eight of them are pathogens. Uh, it can survive 140 degrees, it can stay alive in salt water. Does it grow and reproduce in salt water? I'm not sure. Uh, it's normally found in humans and in animals, and it can be found in nature, in leaf litter and, and so on. The bottom one, Clostridium, is a little bit more serious. Uh, it produces spores that can survive cooking temperatures, and it produces toxins that also survive at a high temperature. Um, if you get infected with this, it will seem like you have the 24-hour flu where you're vomiting, diarrhea, you want, wish you were dying, and then you know, 18 hours later, you're glad you didn't. <laughs> it can also be found in nature, and, and both of these statements about can be found in nature is something that we as authors are going to look into even more as we're preparing our manuscript because we want to get a better grasp on that. Initially we were thinking that these were chosen as indicator species because they're not so common in nature, they're more indicative of human sewage, human waste, uh, which I think is the case. But the other point I want to make about these is that they are not necessarily a problem. They're not the thing that's, that we're most concerned about. They are the thing that's easiest for the state to measure, to sample. And it's the things that are in the water along with these that are generally the problem. So if you have these, then you generally have uh, viruses like hepatitis A or norovirus or other things. And these viruses are usually the things that are more of a health concern. These are pretty much only a concern if you're in the hospital and you're already in a weakened state. These are the uh, opportunistic things that, that won't respond to antibiotics generally. So back in, well, since 1985, but most recently, 2003 through 2009, the, the US Environmental Protection Agency did some extensive studies, and they're trying to get a grasp on how do you tell how many people are going to get sick, or what's the health impact of being in water that is known to have, you know, effluent, wastewater effluent. And so they looked at all of these, you know, various diseases, and they counted up how many people were getting these things, and they did the statistics, and. They found, as I was saying, viruses are usually the thing that's making you sick. It's not so much the, those particular microbes. They did not study a large enough population to tell if there's any difference in illness rates between children, elderly, pregnant people versus, you know, people in middle age. Um, <laughs> typo. There's a... Uh, they also sort of reconfirm there's no perfect indicator. So what they came up with, this is their 2002 uh, recreational water quality criteria, and they estimate 36 people are going to get sick, 36 people out of 1,000, if you have the geometric mean of 35 for enterococcus in a marine setting. So. That's why they came up with these values, either the standard numbers that I was showing you a little bit earlier, 
And this STV is a statistical threshold value. That's if there's more than 10% of the samples are above this value of 130. That's when they, they consider that the water is impaired. It's also possible you could have a lower uh, infection rate of 32 if you set the standard a little lower. But why did you choose to do that? So, one of the next questions people ask, where are the impacted sites? Uh, these are some of the maps that Sarah put together using an earlier version of my uh, preliminary data. And I'm sorry, I'm, I know you can't read them. These are really more designed to be poster-sized uh, and printed out. But these circles here, little pie charts, I'll be showing you some more later that you can see. But these just indicate where the sites are and some indication of how serious the the impairment is. So a green circle is just a site and then the colors in it indicate how, right. how bad or good the water is. Right, so this is really a, a, a failed effort on my part to convey the information, but it has value because you can at least get a sense of where the sites are in a big picture. Uh, that was for uh, the Clostridium, this is for Enterococcus. So, I was talking about these before. It shows a lot of great information, but it doesn't show you the proportions or the relative number of each thing because so many of these dots are on top of each other. So that's why I came up with these bigger pie charts. So, for Fleming Beach North, the 30 day sets, there's 116 of them. And you can see, at a glance, how many of them are red, orange, yellow, and green. So I'm, I'm hoping this is a better way to convey our results. Um, these little pies down here, this is for a clostridium, this is for the enterococcus. And this, these refer, like, this refers to the 30-day sets. This refers to the individual samples. Remind us again what a good number and a bad number is, could you? So, green on this chart means, for enterococcus, means the value is, is 10 or less. The yellow is, um, It's below 35, it's above 10, below 35, but it has to do with how many samples there are. That was in the, the very busy chart that's going to be explained in our manuscript later. Uh, the red ones, the red samples are the ones that exceed the statistical threshold value or the geometric mean. These numbers, well, the numbers over here can also indicate that there's a chronic condition of that applies to the old standards that has not been met. So, the new version of posters that I'd like to produce, uh, this is not necessarily for the manuscript, but this is because this is a community-funded science project, I'm thinking that having nice posters for the community for <laughs> meetings like this is a good idea. So I wanted to come up with something where we have those little scatter plots <coughs> combined with the little pie charts. So from at a distance, you can get a really great idea where the impairments are. And these tie over here to the, the map. And this map, uh, this is just a mock-up, so it's going to get better when we have a real, when Sarah gets on it, I guess. And, uh, <laughs> no pressure. I just threw this together a few days ago, so she hasn't even seen it yet herself. So this is a mock-up for South Maui and for North Shore. Uh, you'll notice they're all the same because this is a mock-up. I haven't uh, taken the time to actually produce. I do have all the pie charts and all the scatter charts. I haven't put them all over in here yet. Uh, so where are the impacted sites? Well, the maps we were just looking at answer that to some degree and what are the possible sources? Well, our last paper was sensationalized uh, uh, to our dismay. 
Uh, so I wanted to point out, Malia and I went and we had a tour of our wastewater facility here in Kihei, and we were just blown away. We were really impressed that everybody that we've met from there is super nice people. They're really passionate about producing excellent quality water. And this is the ultraviolet lamps. So all the water, all the effluent is treated with ultraviolet, which kills, I don't know what percentage, over 99% of the microbes that are in the water. All the water is treated, whether it's used for uh, irrigation or injected. Uh, the water they produce, you can't tell the difference between that and tap water. I suppose it would taste different, but I didn't uh, try it. <laughs> and your garden can tell the difference. Your garden would be really happy with the, the effluent. Um, the other thing to be proud about our facility in Kihei is that they are among the leaders, I think, nationwide in terms of water reuse, the amount of water that's being reused, and they have plans to reuse even more. So because of the UV uh, treatment that they get, our injected wastewater is not a big microbe threat, not that I can tell. And I, I haven't confirmed yet uh, what the UV treatment does to the viruses that might be in there. And that's something that's waiting for later when I have more time to uh, begin working on the manuscript. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the effluent plume from the Kihei plant. Many of you have probably seen this before. Uh, this is the coast down here. This is the injection well. This distance is approximately one mile. Uh, it's foreshortened, but the distance along the the shoreline is uh, about 0.93 miles, so it's just under a mile, so it's cut in half. And this chart is talking about the amount of nitrogen that's in seawater or just the, uh, the upcountry groundwater that's coming down from the forests thousands of years ago. It's about that much nitrogen. And then this is the, let's see, oh. It's a cross gradient well. We can ignore that one for the moment. But this is the treated effluent, and then this is a denitrified effluent. And it, it looks like these numbers are fairly close together, but you have to pay attention over here. This is a logarithmic scale. So this is 10, this is 100, that's 1,000. So over here, the upcountry water has 84. I think these are micromoles. And the treated effluent is 523. So five or six times as much nitrogen in the treated effluent. And this is from Hunt and Rosa in 2009, really excellent work. This is where they're sampling the water, and the red circles are indicating where they found a lot of fresh water coming down into the ocean. And the blue circles means it's a little bit less fresh, more uh, saline. And they compared that to me, are samples. Talking, are you talking about fresh water in terms of purity, or just um, underwater, like groundwater discharges? It's, it's fresh water, it's underwater uh, groundwater, uh, submarine groundwater discharge. So it's the fresh portion. What they're looking at is the salinity, and they're saying, well. You can feel it with your feet. You can feel it with your feet. The red circles are 25 to 41% fresh water, with the balance being seawater. Uh, oops. Over here, it, they're taking samples you know, at the same locations, but now they're analyzing it for nitrogen content. And they're finding up here, this is the. Uh, what we're referring to is just the, the aquifer, the groundwater, without effluent. And down here we're seeing that there is effluent. So, taking a sidestep for just a moment, one process that I go through when I'm writing a paper like this, trying to get a grasp of the bigger picture to help guide us, you know, in what we're going to be looking at. So. Apologize again, I'm sure you can't read this, but effluent flow rates 
we're looking at about 2 million gallons per day of effluent that's injected around this time of year. It's less in the summer. So that turns out to be 33 semi-tankers of injectate per day, or uh, 14 semi-tankers per hour. That's how much water is going into the ocean in those locations I was just showing you. So along the entire shoreline of Kalama and Cove Park, you have to imagine about 2,400 people standing shoulder to shoulder, and they're each pouring a one-gallon bucket of effluent every two minutes into the ocean, 24 hours a day. So that's how much water we're injecting and how much is bubbling up. So in terms of nitrogen, that's you know bags of fertilizer. This is a chicken manure fertilizer. I just looked for something that was popular for the garden because I wanted to do a, a comparison. So the uh, the regular groundwater, the amount of water that we're talking about bubbling up, that's only 26 bags of fertilizer, and that's per day. The treated effluent would be 163, and if it's denitrified, it's 93. So that's how, I mean, just imagine what we're putting in the ocean. That's what I wanted to get a sense of. So are there trends in locations? Well, this is a bigger picture. Uh, up here is Malaya, Kihei. This is the wastewater treatment plant, Coloma Park, Cove Park. And over here is Maui Meadows. And one question, one hypothesis that we're exploring is, well, what's happening to all of that throughout the island? I don't know, I mean to be picking on Maui Meadows, but throughout the island, we've had these septic systems and cesspools that have been in service for decades. And where is that effluent going and can we detect it? And one thing that we're considering is the possibility that the microbes are an indicator of that effluent. My hypothesis is that the, the volume of effluent is so much smaller, it's not millions of gallons per day, from these places, but the, the nutrients are still coming into the ocean, and I think they're coming into the ocean at a low enough rate that they get absorbed by the ecosystem very readily. So we're not really going to be measuring a lot of free nitrogen or free uh, phosphorus, but we'll be seeing the microbes because they're left behind. So that's one thing that, that we're exploring. It may be valid, it may not, I'm not sure. So we got into this study wanting to being concerned about human health impacts and wanting to look at that but the data the analysis has kind of taken us in this other direction um, now we're getting to the over time question and this is intentionally a bad slide so I don't feel like I need to apologize <laughs> <laughs> this is 28 years along the bottom and this is all, what, uh, 79 sites along the side. So we're looking at when every, every little dot on there indicates a water sample that's been analyzed for a Clostridium or for Enterococcus. And at this level, you can't resolve the detail, but there's also the little colored circles that indicate every time, every every occasion in time when I've been able to aggregate, you know, make a 30-day set and calculate a geometric mean. So those are on here as well. And those are the things that show up uh, much darker. So, does anything jump out at you, even, even blurry and far away? Can you see patterns? A lot of red ones down there at the bottom. Lots of samples, some places. Yeah. Well, one thing I'm noticing is over here, this is the, uh, let's see, this is 1989 to uh, 1998 are these samples. I'm noticing that these sites, it's impacted here. I'm seeing some yellow and red, but it's not impacted as much as it is over here. Just, you know, a few years later. 
So what I'm seeing here is there's a significant difference in, over time between the left column and the right column. And that's something that we're going to be looking at. We're going to have to pull out the you know, mathematical statistical tools um, that biologists use that I'm ignorant about. But, uh, so we'll get something figured out there. But that's going to be happening in the month of February. So maybe later I'll be able to tell you about it. The other thing that I, that I notice in here is it doesn't matter if you're in West Maui, South Maui, or North Shore, we're seeing the same kind of patterns. And one thing that I began to, to wonder is, how did the state choose the sites that they sample so frequently? Um, and one thing that I don't want to say seems suspicious to me, but um, coincidental to me, is that they measured the sites that were um, down below Maui Meadows, and they measured a site up on west side, uh, Hanaka'o'o, <coughs> which is down below a, a, I guess you'd call it a subdevelopment, probably more familiar with that. Non-sewered subdivision. It's a non-sewered subdivision, thank you, that's the right phrase. Um, I had a friend who lived there for a while, so I became familiar with the area. This place goes back to the 1920s it was built. Houses are fairly close together, and down slope in the water from there is one of the most highly impacted sites we're seeing. I didn't point it out earlier, but that's one where there's lots of the red blobs. Excuse me, do you have more recent statistics for this than 2004? Oh, that's the gap. The, the gap is, the, this starts at 2004, so the gap is from 98 so, to 2004. That's right. that's the area where there's no oh, And it goes to? No data. It, the correct? most recent is uh, November of, did uh, I put it on here? No. It's October, I think, of, of 2016. Yeah. Oh, okay. October or November, oh, I just, so just a few months ago. Okay, thank you. Yeah, no, I thought I had that somewhere. Now, yeah, so now there's going to be another gap of who knows how large. Okay, so that's pretty much the end of the presentation. People ask me what we need. Uh, one thing that we need is the cesspool septic system GIS layer. One thing that I want to do is take the results that we have and start doing sort of a spatial analysis and look at is there any correlation? Is there anything to this hypothesis of? Uh, cesspool and septic system, you know, locations being correlated with impacted water. And it can be areas that are now on sewer, but decades ago were not on sewer. Places where I live, for example, in North Kihei, dates back to the, the cane camp times. And the property that I'm on has a, a cesspool that was in use in the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, up until the sewer system went in. So I know that the groundwater flowing through there, I, I didn't get a, a little uh, movie of the water bubbling up at our beach, but there's a, a spring right there, and I'm sure that that water is impacted. So this is one of the things that we want to look at. Uh, we also need the watershed decision unit, GIS layer, uh, nobody can give us that yet because the Department of Health hasn't finalized it. Uh, I, I keep mentioning the historic housing developments. If anybody has information on how we can find when some of these developments were built, uh, I'd be interested in looking maps. at that. There's 1920s maps? Yeah. USGS. Yeah. Um, also, if anybody has access to a large format plotter, I'd love to make the big posters that I've been talking about that are going to be given to the uh, Kihei Community Association at the end of the study. Um, and as, I, as far as I know, I think we're still looking for funding for the, for the project. Uh, just a quick question. One of your slides indicated a sampling from the east side. Yeah, with my poor vision, I didn't see any data from the east side. Do you have samples on the east coast? There, uh, there were a few samples from Honomanu, um, a few from um, Hana Bay. Yeah, 
right now. Yeah, and I guess my follow-up to that would be, do you have a control site at all? Anything to compare these discharges, polluted discharge areas, to what would be well, an area that's not heavily populated used. that we could eventually strive for? Uh, the, the sites that you're talking about that would be considered control sites are not frequently sampled. So uh, there are some of these sites that we might be able to look at where there is uh, you know, some infrequent sampling. I think they're choosing these sites because they know they're impaired and they're wanting to keep track of, of what's going on. Lucienne was just pointing out that down at uh, Kinao is considered one of the clean areas, so... It's that used would, as a control of many studies that I've read. Right, so that would be a good... Uh, because good there's, there's no development in this lava, so... But I haven't seen... I haven't, that doesn't show up here anywhere. So, that leads into one of the comments that I was going to make. Um, I didn't put a slide up, but one of the follow-up studies... I mean, this is, this is very high-level and broad, so it's more of a survey kind of study to tell us what's called for, maybe what we should be doing next. And one of the things that I'm going to propose, uh, we are going to get in touch with uh, Daniel Amato and see if maybe he would want to uh, submit a grant proposal, perhaps, for looking at the nutrients coming out at these sites where we're seeing high microbe content to confirm this hypothesis that we're talking about, where you take the algae suspend it in a little cage in the water column and see is it feeding on nitrogen that came from humans versus other sources. Um, so that's something that, that we'll be discussing or pointing out in the paper, I suppose, but there are many ways that we can go forward from this. Uh, I'm going to suggest one other. Okay. I mean, I think this is great to have, you know, all this has just been lying around and no one could, like, put their hand, head around it yeah. so that we can actually use it. But when you read reports um, on um, monitoring efforts that are uh, mandated, like McKenna Resort has had to do uh, mandatory testing for over 15 years as a condition of, of you know, development approvals. And they have, a, um, they have a consultant who says, well, yeah, these waters appear impaired, impaired, but you know what's wrong? The state standards are, are wrong, and that's the problem. So I think we really need a, 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 you know, some data to say, no, the state standards are showing that there's a problem that matches these other tests, mm -hmm. and then we need to repudiate things like that that are put into the public record, and this person's data is reported to the Department of Health, and they use it in their 303D report. So, I think as the consul, this is something we need to bring a little truth out to, to some of these um, wayward consultants and, and their conclusions. Um, well, <laughs> in defense of the Department of Health, I, I will just point out that this, what you're seeing here, took an enormous amount of effort. I've been working full time on this since the end of October, and uh, this is all I've been doing. And, and as you saw, I mean, there's over 20,000 samples that we started with, and, and we didn't know how to visualize it or how to even analyze it in a way that could that the public could readily absorb. And I think I've succeeded to some degree. But you know, Department of Health, they're not using these techniques. They're, they're doing something else. Maybe after seeing this, uh, they'll adopt some of these ideas moving forward. Uh, we should call it quits. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much. Lots of great information. Thank you very much. So for those of you who haven't been to the council meetings recently or ever, uh, the two things that the Green Resource Council has been doing about our, the concern over poor water quality, of course, was to, as I told you earlier, we asked, we held a workshop and we asked Steve Carpacoli to write a plan. And as we all know, the plan sitting on the shelf isn't going to do anybody any good. So I am working on trying to get that before the county council. It's been a little more challenging than usual because of the dysfunction that's going on right now in the county council. Uh, but I have been meeting with various council members and talking with others and seeing if we can get the Steve's plan before the council and hopefully get them to adopt the plan uh, and for improving water quality in South Maui. 
The other thing we've done is uh, to hooey up to join forces with several other nonprofits, the Nature Conservancy, Rich to Read, uh, and UH Mountain College, mm -hmm. and start this water quality program that several of our several people here tonight have been talking about participating in, and Dana is leading it. Uh, on West Maui, we have 17 sites on West Maui where our water quality folks are going out and collecting data every second week. We're going to move that to every third week, but at least we'll have some more information. Right now, the DOH is not collecting any data uh, around Maui because Roland, our, we only have one person, Roland, and he retires. So now we have the only data we have is that that's being collected by Dana and, and her supporters. I heard they fill the position with Megan Daly. Yeah. 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 Yes, yeah, we understand that they did, They, uh, but she hasn't started yet. It's an 89-day position, and she hasn't started yet, but they, and I understand they'll be able to renew that three times. I think she might have just started. Oh, maybe she just started? I heard she just started. Okay, so. that's good news. Yeah. That's a good person to have yeah. in that position. Oh, yeah. awesome. She's yeah. absolutely yeah. awesome. Yeah. yeah. So. yeah. So we're doing those two things. We'd like to expand the program on West Maui to another six sites fairly soon. And we'd also like to expand it to South Maui. And I would love us to do HANA. And um, we have some very good news, and that is that Surfrider has now gotten involved in this. And so I was going to ask Mike if he would tell us what Surfrider is doing. Sure. Now, following that presentation, that was pretty impressive. Um, a little background again. My mom, um, probably the only thing I'm an expert in is loving the water. I love the ocean. I came from Orange County eight years ago with my family and had a lot of, uh, had some ear, nose, throat. I've seen my ENT doctor all the time, so I said, Yeah, I got to move someplace where there's clean water. Here, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm in this meeting. Just, <laughs> um, but yes, change is on the way. And I feel one person and many can make a difference here. But yeah, so I'm I'm uh, also a, kind of not an expert, but uh, it's a background in business and finance. And uh, so I'm, you know, like I said before, I kind of raised my hand in the Surfrider meeting. Hey, we should not test some water, and they're like. How about you? And, um, so what I've done, and uh, i got to thank Lucy Ann for roping me in. She got me in here about a year ago, and I'm all fired up. But uh, uh, simply put, I'm just going to give you the basics. Um, I'm copying a program that's being done on Kauai. If anyone knows Carl Bird, uh, he's got a pretty extensive background, a lot of knowledge in this. I'm piggybacking. I've had numerous calls with Carl, and also uh, tying in with Donna Brown at the college. Uh, uh, Donna is just so wonderful. We're going to use her lab. Uh, her students uh, need to complete projects to get credit. Uh, so this is an incredible opportunity to tie in the students, the lab, and uh, have them run the test. But it's all started about a year ago. Again, I'll point Lucy in again. But uh, uh, you know, with the Caneland on the North Shore transition. It's like, hey, what's you know what what's happening? What's happening to the water as the land use changes? What's going to happen to the water? So we thought, you know, I raised, you know, well, we should probably start some baseline studies. Let's see what we have now. And so to start, we're going to do 16 sites going east as far as Peagi, aka Jaws, uh, and the, the crazy guys and gals that paddle out there. That's about the only water use, but we're also concerned about the fishermen that are fishing. And Surfrider's goal, as we all know, is access, maintaining access, and maintaining clean ocean water for us all to enjoy, whether we're fishing or, or swimming or however we're using the water. But going from Peagi, 16 sites all the way around the harbor to Waihu uh, stream, uh, I, I, and a couple others picked those sites. We're going to start there. Uh, we have uh, not going to have 16,000 data points. Uh, we're going to look at uh, eight, t eight different tests and uh, at the 16 different sites. Uh, Dana brought up a great point. I was thinking once a month, but that may follow a similar tide pattern. So maybe we'll look at a, a three-week interval. And uh, Surfrider is providing the funding. We're going to start testing. Uh, so I'm assembling a team, putting the word out. If anyone lives on the North Shore and they have a little extra time and want to 
participate in the program. We'd love to tie in, and we would love to collaborate with uh, with this group. I mean, such a knowledgeable, uh, uh, lot of depth, and uh, uh, ultimately, I think we can run the tests and get the results. But then, what we do with those in terms of publishing, as well as if we run across problem areas, what's what are the next steps? What what's the process we take? to notify the public and uh, maybe steps towards uh, fixing the problems if that's that's a possibility. So, yeah, I heard the word adapting. Uh, you know, I came here to learn tonight. Here I am presenting. Uh, you know, we all have to learn to adapt and, and figure this out and work together. So, look forward to doing that. Thank you, Mark. But I was just wondering, is anyone approaching the legislature to try to get more funding for these water quality testing positions? I've talked with uh, Ross Baker and also Camilla Ng, Good. and um, you know, I need to get back to both of them. But yes, we need to. The whole purpose of this is to come up with the data to make up make the point that water quality is degraded. And I would argue that the lack of data and the lack of in person to collect data is justification in itself. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, so we're, uh, we're talking with um, people at the EPA, so the federal level, the state level, and the county. But like I said, the county is a little, you, know, you can read in the newspaper. So. And we need money for more than monitoring, too, because the data in itself and knowing where the problems are in itself doesn't Step do anything. One. There needs to be a higher level analysts, and modelers, all kinds of folks, if we really want to make this change. Absolutely. Yeah. The data is just the starting point. Right. So the funding needs are pretty large. Well, it's important because there's a lot of talk, I don't know if you've seen um, on social media, there's a lot of talk about um, maybe we've reached our limits with tourism, and the carrying capacity studies are being called for. Um, and I think that it would behoove the tourism industry take it seriously and take the lead on this, actually, to protect our own industry. So maybe that that would be the kind of attack that I would take with the legislators. Yeah, and with the county as well. Our, our, our economy depends on visitors. And That's right. Thank you. Uh, Dana, do you have any, th any comments you'd like to make, any updates on your program, our program? Um, Oh, I, I mean, I, I love when we talk about water quality. <laughs> uh, but um, your, your Mike, uh, I talked to Mike short, for a little while before this, and we have some nice fine ladies here who have, uh, you know, been doing water quality on South Maui. They did it before um, the sanctuary quit doing water quality. So I was really happy to see these guys here and maybe get them involved too. Um, but adapting as you go is an important uh, thing to keep in mind. I love that uh, Robin brought that up because that's certainly what we've had to do. We start out with one thing in mind and we go, ah, this is the way we're going to do it. Well, we, we need to modify that a little bit. So um, hopefully uh, Mike can benefit some from what we we learn as we go. and uh, but, but we're still learning as we go. But if the program has done really well and we're very excited. Uh, and we're hoping to expand to those northern sites and help get a southern, you know, the South Maui start that uh, everybody wants water quality monitoring. So if Mike and Surf Rider can pick up on the north side and we can uh, get more data, that's, that's really key. But the, I guess the other point I wanted to make is monitoring is monitoring, and it doesn't mean you monitor for X amount of time and then you're done. Monitoring means you're going to watch that water quality just like you would watch anything else from here forward, hopefully. That's the idea because that's the only way you're going to know if anything you're doing is affecting change in the, in the water uh, or if something that's happening is making it worse uh, if you don't continuously monitor it. No, thank you, David. Have other islands gone through the same process, or is uh, the University of Hawaii involved in any of um, the water quality studies or anything like that? I'm just wondering if there's something we can copy or work in. I think that 
think there's collaboration a with everybody must be having the same issues. There's a lot of researchers who, who will do specific projects. I think the key that we're trying to do here on Maui is we're trying to start a monitoring program that monitors continuous, that, that just monitors. Uh, I shouldn't say just monitors, but monitors all the time. It's not a we're doing a, a two-year study or we're doing a one-year study and we're going to look at this. That's, that's not what we're doing. I mean, that's part of what's happened with the Department of Health. Sometimes they'll monitor someplace for a year, and then they don't monitor it again for five years. And, and so then you've got these big gaps. You don't know, you know, there's... And issues. that is funding driven, pretty yeah. much 100% funding I'm sure driven, it is. those kind of decisions. It's I'm not sure what they want to do. Yeah, I'll let you know Kauai and Oahu and Big Island Surf Rider have been conducting studies on those three islands uh, for, I'm not sure how long, but uh, quite a few years. And Mike, do they, have a, do they have a CLAP, a quality assurance project plan? I'm sure they do. I'm not sure if it's the same acronym or the same, uh, uh, but uh, yeah, Carl Berg, uh, he is, uh, he speaks the language and uh, yeah, we're going to be, like I said, copycatting that program. Uh, yeah, Carl came over and got us started too. We had perfect. Him, yeah, okay. we had him talk to us and then the workshop and yeah. yeah so he great got started. individual. I wasn't quite sure if they actually have a, a the quality assured plan. Yeah, Carl does. They I, do. I know. Okay. Yes. Uh, but yeah, so to answer your question, that without uh, coming up with a quality quality, a quality assurance project plan, sorry, short project, um, then the data is not useful to DOH. So we decided to go through that, you know, spend the time and the effort. When I say we did, it was Dana and Kim who did. Uh, and that took the better part of two years, didn't it? To write the plan. So it's not something that you can write very easily or that just anybody can sit down and write. But once you have that plan and the state knows that you're collecting water samples under their guidelines, then it becomes more valuable to them. So that's why I was asking Mike if you guys had a, are, are operating under such a plan. Yeah. And the should be able to give you a copy of this. Oh, believe me, I'm sure Carl has <laughs> things to give me. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm going to. We finish with this subject for tonight, and then also in the comments, I just had an announcement for all of you, and that is that for some of you uh, who don't know, we have a coral reef recovery team that we assembled back in 2010 of scientists who are very well known, highly respected, and Brad Tar lived close. We would have had him on it. Um, anyway, they did come up with a a recovery plan. They, and that's what we use as our Bible. We just I go to page 38 and look at what I'm supposed to do. <laughs> so uh, we have the plan and we are following it. And once they wrote the plan, we thought, well, they're all going to leave, right? They did their job. But that's not true. They decided they all wanted to stay. Every one of them wanted to stay and continue to advise and provide guidance uh, in the implementation of the plan. Some of you may know Dr. Bob Richmond, he chairs, he's very well known as a very highly respected throughout the world as a coral reef scientist, he's the chair of that group. And we have people like Alan Freelander and Mark Dikos and Eric Conklin and uh, Mike Field from USGS are on the, on the team. So we just met with them again in January and asked them what they thought we ought to do, we as a council ought to do about the governor's initiative called the 3030 initiative. And in that initiative, he, he committed to having 30% of Hawaii's reefs effectively managed, interesting word, right, effectively managed by 2030. And we would have preferred that he said that they were protected, but he said effectively managed. We don't know if that means that it's okay to have 70% that are ineffectively managed. <laughs> but we're just looking, trying to look at the positive side and go, okay, this is what he said and, and we're going to try to comply. There's a lot of definitions that need to be ironed out uh, on that, like 30% of what? Right? How far out are we talking? Are we going to include the, the deeper reefs and all? So we have to iron all that out. But we asked the team if they thought that the team, the Coral Reef Recovery Team, and now we know the Resource Council, should play a role in, in, in supporting that initiative. 
and unanimously <laughs> the team voted absolutely. They wanted that. I went, oh, oh, more work for me, right? <laughs> um, but that's what they decided, and they're going to continue to lead the process instead of just getting together once a year, as we've had the past two years now. Uh, we're going to get bring them together more often and try to iron out those um, you know, what, what steps, what comes next. <laughs> Three of the people who are on the Coral Reef Recovery Team are also on Suzanne Case's advisory group about the 3030. So for those three folks who are very close to Suzanne Case, she's the chair of the Department of Land and Natural Resources, who will be carrying out this initiative for the governor. So they've got her ear. Uh, she's looking to them for guidance. And they wrote a letter to her suggesting that the Coral Reef Recovery Team and the Maui Nui Resource, Re Resource Council are really best positioned, uh, they think, in Hawaii, but certainly at least on Maui, to do this because we have a plan and other things that we've written since then. And um, so there we are. So I just wanted to let you know that, that that's what they voted on and uh, are going to help us do. So all of you who want to be involved in that, we'd really like to have your help. It's going to be a big project. Any comments on that? Yay! Yay! <laughs> Any nays? Anyone think we shouldn't do that? <laughs> well, just to give a historical perspective, I remember when Tony came to us with the idea of a coral reef recovery team. It was like you know, 2008, 2009. We went, we're just a little startup organization. How are we going to do that? And he wrote this grant to the National Marine Fish, Fishing Service, whatever it is, NIF Wings. And um, Lo and behold, it's actually done some good. So, ten years later, yeah. Yeah. ten years later, you know, the governor's initiative. Yeah. <laughs> so, I'd like to finish a little early tonight. I think we should maybe start doing that all the time, just finish by six thirty, <laughs> because I found that all of us like standing around talking to each other uh, for at least half an hour. So, I hope that you'll do that and enjoy some more snacks and talk to each other. We do need to put the tables and the chairs back. So if you're able to help us with that, the chairs go over there and the tables go to the And I want to thank you so much, everybody, for coming. Dan has a comment. Now, I just want to make a point. You probably all know, but if you don't, uh, Will Sparrow put in the bill to, well, we thought they banned the hockey yeah. zone. Yeah, and yeah. And it's when the bill is evolving, which has gotten good support, it's not to ban it, but at least to be labeling it and showing it. So when you see these things coming along, sending in testimony, you're going to testify. Good idea. Will Good job, Dan.